Good day. Um, welcome to the Leicester Royal Infirmary's Emergency Department Induction Program. Uh, my name is Jay Banerjee, one of the consultants here, and I am very pleased to be talking to you about something I am very passionate about, frail older people. Now, when you think traditional emergency medicine, you don't normally think of frail older people because we think of um, much more exciting stuff like you know young people um, being smashed up at 140 miles an hour on their motorcycle or somebody's been climbing has fallen down an entire mountain and has got you know uh, smashed bones everywhere or somebody having a an incredible mi with massive ecg changes unfortunately uh, emergency medicine as we know has very much moved on as a result of demographics and the purpose of this talk is to really uh, get us to understand how to use a common shared language for understanding a huge chunk of the current population that we see in emergency departments, certainly across pretty much of what we call the sort of Western world. So if you're working in like Canada or USA, UK, any European department, um, uh, certainly uh, Hong Kong, um, lots of places in China, I understand, and of course, New Zealand and Australia, um, then older people are a huge chunk of the population that we see. So let's move on to some case studies to try and get an understanding of what we are talking about here. So the first case, if you look at it, I'm describing a care home resident, 85 years old, uh, lives in a nursing home, uh, needs help with washing, dressing, eating, uh, has got poor mobility, uh, but does not use his frame, probably because he forgets to. Frequent falls, double incontinence, has got worsening dementia, suffers a fall and has been brought into the emergency department for a checkup with a small scalp bruise. As you can see, the GCS is 13, which is uh, roughly normal for, for, for him, which is, of course, something, again, we need to think about is what is it we consider normal. Uh, and, of course, to add uh, insult to injury in terms of us trying to assess him, he won't allow any observations and certainly pulls his arm away every time you try to do bloods. This is not a incredibly uncommon presentation, and you will be seeing these kind of older people in our emergency department. And I will let you think about what are you going to do, because at this point, I won't be giving you any answers, but moving on to the next slide. 91-year-old lady lives alone. I will let you read the slide by herself, but you will notice what I've thrown in here is something about medications and there is some clue that maybe there is something which is important and we need to think about. Let's move on to the case study number three. So 78 year old gentleman, um, reasonably fit and well, tripped on uneven paving stone. He's been brought in uh, with all the spinal precautions. So he's got a collar on, he's on a hard spinal board uh, for transfer. Uh, and he's got some painful hip and some chest pain and some neck pain. And as you can see, unlike the lady in the previous case, this gentleman is on aspirin only. So again, start thinking about how you're going to approach this person while we move on to case four. 85 year old gentleman um, is normally fit. No CI means cognitive impairment. So he drives. Um, He's been coming because he's been feeling unwell. He's got a temperature. You'll see some abnormal uh, tests in there, including a positive urine dip. He's got central abdominal pain. I will let you spend a moment thinking about how the central abdominal pain correlates with the urine dip, uh, positive for leukocytes. Um, and he's got some crackles in the, in the chest, uh, but no consolidation on the chest X-ray. I'll let you also think a little bit about how that correlates with his temperature. And of course, how are we going to approach and manage this particular gentleman who's very different to the previous three cases. And lastly, but not least, I've got a 78 year old who is also not an uncommon patient I've seen in our emergency departments, is bed dependent, hoisted bed to chair, so totally mobile, double incontinence, has got sacral sore, not eating or drinking for a couple of weeks, sodium, absolutely up there. Um, blood show metabolic acidosis and those are the examination findings including a low blood pressure and the question is what are we going to do? Notice the respiratory rate of 16 and spend a moment thinking about its relevance especially in the light of the other data. Right, now that you've seen these cases which are representative of the kind of patients you will be seeing in our emergency department 
let's talk a little bit about what typically happens to older people nowadays present in emergency departments. So the bottom line is older people coming to EDs suffer poor outcomes. The plus point about this is that it's not just in this country. This is from a study that was published way back in, um, as you can see, in 2011, uh, which included information from published papers from all over the world and including some data from the American College of Emergency Physicians who carried out a survey in 2008. And you will notice the areas where we are failing older people. So we got poor diagnosis, a lot of intra-abdominal conditions, unsuspected diagnosis, including delirium, which is missed left, right, and center, under treatment. And here there's probably a degree of ageism that comes in, especially when it comes to um, cardiac interventions where, you know, a lot of centers kind of don't believe that they should be taking on people who are above the age of 80 or 85. Um, and certainly over treatment, just think of folic catheters, you know, we absolutely uh, don't hesitate in sticking in um, IV lines or, or intra-uretary catheters into older people and, and the effect of that. Uh, by the way, 1% of all people uh, who get a catheter actually die because 10% of all uh, catheterized um, older people develop a urosepsis and 10% of all the urosepsis die. So, so that's 1% mortality just by putting in a Foley catheter uh, so you know next time you're just about to do one. So the term I'm going to introduce to you in case you haven't heard of it medically is a common medieval English term called frailty. Frailty typically refers to uh, a state of being weak. So as you can well imagine, is not a term we would like to use with our older patients because the connotations are in simple English. It means that we think they are weak and people don't want to feel weak or to be referred to as being weak. So I would definitely caution you that don't use the term when you're talking to your patients, don't tell them you're frail. Uh, but by all means, you can use medical terminology in describing how their body systems are not as brilliant as they used to be in coping with simple things like simple infections, um, which is why they can present with non-specific unwell-being. They can also present very easily with confusion. Um, you'll find this fairly common. Continence issues. So this is both. Um, urinary incontinence as well as fecal continence, uh, severe constipation, which typically goes also with urinary continence as in retention of urine. And then of course falls. Falls are probably one of the commonest reasons why an ambulance is called out um, in the UK and incredibly common because the vast majority of people who fall in this particular uh, area are older people and we need to be very aware of, of what causes falls and how we manage it. Um, then of course Older people who are dying, uh, this is probably one of the most under-appreciated um, uh, areas in, in, in emergency departments. Uh, we seem to have a real inability to acknowledge at times the fact that a person is just dying. And that it doesn't matter what we are going to do, they're still going to die. Uh, and therefore, uh, instead of trying to do everything and prolong their suffering, maybe treating them so that they are made comfortable, maybe a much more kinder uh, way of dealing with such a situation. So we will, we will talk about that briefly. And then of course, infection. So older people are responsible. Not a great way of describing it, but in some ways that is the way to think about it for the vast majority of sepsis that present in emergency departments. And guess what? A lot of these sepsis are missed out because they present as non-specifically unwell. At the same time, a lot of people with confusion are inappropriately given antibiotics because they're assumed to be septic, um, and most of them aren't. Delirium is not a common cause of, uh, is not a common presentation of sepsis in an older person. Uh, it's more commonly due to um, drug side effect or um, due to retention of urine or constipation or pain. Um, sometimes it is due to uh, dementia. So uh, it's called behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia or BPSD, which can present like delirium. So whenever you see delirium, please do not reach for a syringe of antibiotics, but try to do an assessment on the patient. 
Another thing to really remember in terms of infections and sepsis is that if you see an older person with a fever, you can be pretty damn certain that they have a bacterial infection. This is completely different to a child, but especially under the age of five. Uh, in more than 90% of cases with a fever, the child will have a virus. The tables are completely turned as we get older, and in an 85-year-old with fever, there's a 95% chance it's a bacterial infection rather than a virus. So if you see an older person with a fever, you are not going to get it wrong by giving them antibiotics. So that is something to think about. Although, remember, if this person is dying, antibiotics may not necessarily be the magic that will stop them from dying. Therefore, may easily constitute an unnecessary treatment. So we need to tailor our intervention to the person's state. And of course, trauma increasingly you will see is a big area secondary to nothing but a simple fall from a standing height. And this is by far a, the biggest cause of major trauma in the UK. So this is something which may come as a surprise to you, but 53%, well, this is from data from three years ago, 53% of all the major trauma in the UK are in old people. And the commonest mechanism is not falling from a height of 20 feet, but falling from a height of about six feet, which is standing height. So every time you see an older person who has suffered a fall, it would be prudent to spend 30 minutes doing a quick primary survey to ensure they don't have neck pain, chest pain, or abdo pain, because the connotations of that in an 85-year-old are completely different to that in a 30-year-old who's fallen from a standing height. And of course, the other thing to remember is that all of these presentations are common. In some ways, I refer to them as the specific presentations of frailty. So rather than thinking that actually confusion or retention of urine is an uncommon presentation uh, seen exclusively in older people, uh, I would flip it and say actually older people are the commonest group we see in our recess and our major area. So in the ED, um, both in blue majors, ED red majors, as well as in the ER, uh, the biggest group of patients we see happen to be old. And the commonest way they present are all these presentations which are specific to older people. You just need to know how to manage them, just like you'd learn how to manage pulmonary edema. So let's look a little bit about why that might be the case. Why do older people present in such a way? I am not going to talk to this slide because it is meant to be a very complex and complicated slide. So it's got multiple components making it complicated. And the most important thing is that we can't really tell how those components interact with each other to produce the final common pathway, as in the degree to which they overlap, making it complex. For example, if you look at fall, you will appreciate that fall is due to multiple causes. And every time a person falls, we can't tell which one of those causes have really played the most important role. So when we assess a fall, we assess for all of those things and we also need to bear in mind that each and every one of those things is underpinned by multiple differential diagnoses and multiple medical conditions. So trying to assess for each and every one of those medical conditions would drive you round the bend and make you go completely mad. So I will suggest don't bother doing it. Just try to understand why they've fallen, what injuries have they suffered from a fall, and can you stop them from falling again? And that is a simpler way of tackling something as complex as a fall. And by the way, falls are never, ever not mechanical. So there is nothing called a mechanical fall as all falls are mechanical events. A better way to understand fall is a syncopal fall versus a non-syncopal fall. Let's move on a little bit to this whole concept of what I'm trying to talk about here, which is called frailty. As I said, frailty is a medieval English word, but we have as some sociologists say, misappropriated the term in clinical medicine and taken it for ourselves into an objective construct which tries to get us to think about an older person with poor physiologic reserve and how they become a prey to simple conditions. So if you look at this particular slide, which is from a Lancet paper by chap called Andy Clegg, if you want to look at it, you can Google Clegg Lancet Frailty. I think you'll get the paper. Um, you will notice that dotted line describes an individual's baseline when it comes to functional abilities. Now, younger people or those older people who are not 
frail, typically independent, not living in a care home, when they suffer a minor illness, they suffer the illness and they sort of go back to their baseline after a period of time. Whereas if you're already dependent and frail, you're already functioning at that baseline and near that baseline, you suffer a simple infection, you actually dip below the baseline. So a person who could walk with a frame suddenly can't walk at all following a um, a, a episode of constipation or urinary retention or you know a couple of days of pain relief with codeine. Uh, they've just gone completely weird with that or they've got a simple urinary tract infection and they suddenly stop walking. And guess what? When they get better and they leave the hospital, you will always hear the families say their father or mother has never been the same again, meaning they did not go back to their baseline. And this happens quite a lot. And this is typical of frailty. So two things, first of all, increased vulnerability, and number two, typically a resetting of their baseline. As you can well imagine, when these events become more and more frequent, you're talking about a, a stepwise deterioration in function leading to the inevitable, which is death. So why are we interested in frailty? Because it predicts outcomes. We know that there have already been a few publications, including data from our hospital here in Leicester, which absolutely shows that frailty absolutely predicts outcomes, including mortality, morbidity. And what we do in our department is we use the clinical frailty scale to capture the degree of frailty. Now, this is a, a set of um, based on a big a study carried out in, the, in, in Canada called the Canadian Study on Health and Aging. And they basically tracked thousands of people over a long period of time. And they basically found that as you get older and you've got comorbidities that develop, you start getting physiologically more and more weaker and socially weaker and they play against each other and you basically become more and more frail. And it's captured in the clinical frailty scale. Key things about the frailty scale, and I would encourage you to look at the web links that I've sent to you along with the videos that go with that and the tips on how to use the clinical frailty scale. So first of all, those pictures don't correlate with the degree of frailty. So the adjustment TV guide, don't look at that picture because um, as you can well appreciate uh, that if you look at CFS7, a person in a wheelchair, and I will quote here, uh, Ken Rockwood, the chap who designed the scale, he says all Paralympians are in wheelchairs, but they're not a frailty score of seven. So Freddy score of seven is basically an individual who is completely dependent for personal care, completely means they need their bottom wiped. If they don't need their bottom wiped, but need everything else done to them, as in they are not completely dependent, because wiping at bottom is typically the last aspect of personal care that tends to go, you are a Freddy score of six until then. The moment you need your bottom wiped, you become a seven, which is quite important because the risk of dying is significantly different between six and seven. Uh, and it's interesting how it is also uh, similarly high if the reason why you can't do it is because of a cognitive impairment rather than a physical impediment. So if you're bed dependent and hoisted and you can't wipe your bottom and you've got you, incontinence pads on you to say for seven. But if you can walk around, talk and you know, feed yourself when the food is put in front of you, but you don't really remember to wipe your bottom when you go to the toilet. So somebody has to come with you and do it for you because of dementia. You still have the similar risk of dying. So this is the critical frailty scale. And you will find we put it on a nerve center. Uh, if you look at the links I've sent to you, you will find there is an app which you can download from the Google Android store as well as from the Apple store called the Clinical Frailty Scale. And if you use that app, every time you see an older person, you can absolutely do an accurate clinical frailty score on them, which will help you. And as I said, it predicts outcomes. This is data from UHL, which shows that as your frailty score increases, your risk of death increases. And if you look at the scores of seven, eight, and nine, about 50% of them uh, are alive after a year, um, which means 50% of them have died. So let's revisit our cases. So if you think of this particular case, um, based on the information we have, the frailty score would work out to being at least a six, but we don't know if it's a seven. So I would ring the care home and get some more information. What I would also find out from the care at home 
is this normal behavior because what I'm seeing in front of me may be normal, may be abnormal. And then I would like to know if there is a care plan, if there is a preferred place of care, if there is a preferred place of death. Because this person with his frailty state, which could easily be seven given he's got double incontinence, um, would probably, uh, has probably got a decreased life expectancy. By the way, if you look at care home residents in England, and if you live in a nursing home, then the life expectancy, um, uh, typically the average life expectancy for a nursing home resident is nine months. And if you live in a in a residential home, the average life expectancy is 15 months. So a person by living in a nursing home is already telling you that they pre, pre they, they, they already have a a likely high likelihood of dying within the next year to two years. So you need to be mindful of that. So this person, if they're refusing to do have vitals and bloods, I would just let them not have vitals and bloods. I speak to the care home, I speak to the family, and what I would express is that given the high degree of frailty, the high degree of cognitive impairment, doing a blood test in this person or doing a CT in this person is not really going to make an outcome uh, difference because the risk of dying is not going to change just because I've done a CT on them or I've done a blood test on them. But what I will definitely do is considerably cause a disruption in their in their life and make them a lot more miserable by without gaining anything. So I would probably be very happy based on the, my discussion with the family and with the home and with the senior person. If you don't have confidence, you must speak to a senior. In fact, for the first few weeks, please always speak to a senior, even if you think you know what you're doing. And there will be other talks about how you handle yourself in the ED and you need to be safe, most importantly. So you might discuss with the senior. So a, 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 a appropriate um, management in this patient will be, we don't do anything and we get this person back to the home and uh, develop a care plan, respect document, or we get the GP to, to do it. Um, but of course, you know, if the family insists that we do all of those, we need to think about the fact that they won't allow their friend, we might need to sedate them and the risks of sedation and what are we going to do once they're sedated. So it opens a big can. So and I would certainly advise you to seek senior input in such a scenario, especially when I'm around. Case two, you know, this lady would probably be fine to go home. You, we do not admit people into hospital because they've got a postural drop. Remember, falls is a complex phenomena. Um, the, the important thing is stopping them from falling again. In this situation, I would uh, probably stop their beta blocker. I'd probably stop their simvastatin because it's just causing pelvic muscle wasting. The 91, however, they still have a pretty, um, you know, um, decent ability, pretty score, probably a six. Uh, I would get some further information on what is it the carers actually do for her. I suspect they do all the housework and she can't do any of it. So medication review and probably sort her out and, you know, th definitely think of getting her home and definitely think of increasing her package of care. So she might need input from the FES team, the physio or the OT in the hospital, or the physio and OT in the community, which can be arranged via a spa. This is a gentleman who is fit and well. Uh, the best way to assess and manage him is to do a quick trauma survey and then get him into a CT scanner. Um, he would need a pan scan, head, neck, chest, abdo, pelvis, to find out and define the injuries. And he could have lots of those um, because he is an older person but he's not frail, so actually knowing what is going on with him will allow us to manage him more appropriately. The case for the 85-year-old gentleman, you know, I mean, we really need some more information from the wife in terms of how frail he is, but I suspect he's not frail at all, and his frailty score is probably going to be a three, um, or even a two, who, who knows? He might be running every day. Um, he might even be a frailty score of one. So, you know, we don't assume anything without getting objective information. Bottom line is septic. Um, and uh, I would I would personally do a CT scan of his abdomen to see what is going on. Uh, that urine dip means nothing because he has no urinary symptoms. Uh, if you do not have urinary symptoms, so that is the UXSX and the cough is the CX. If you don't have urinary symptoms, you don't have a UTI, end of story. Even if this urine cultures bacteria, it is asymptomatic bacteriuria. It is not a UTI. So you just need to be very mindful of that. So getting a chest X-ray would be useful. And guess what? In this day and age, we have seen a lot of these patients who have actually had 
um, features in the chest rather than the abdomen suggestive of coronavirus. So that is something to think about. A coronavirus has presented atypically in a lot of older people. The 78 year old, this patient is dying. And I think the more quickly you ask that question, the better you will serve this particular gentleman. Is this person some with a condition that I can cure? The answer is no. His priority score is at least a seven, if not an eight. His sodium is 175. He's got metabolic acidosis. I suspect you'll find he's got an AKI um, of either two or three. Um, he, his heart rate, his respiratory rate are not consistent with his low blood pressure, which is basically showing that his body system is absolutely shutting down. Um, the smelly urine means he's dehydrated, okay? End of story, nothing else to that. So in this situation, very quickly, I would want to have a discussion with the family and talk about end of life care plan. Um, maybe we might go with a 24 hour you know, trial of treatment. Maybe we might decide actually we start end of life drugs and send this person home now or we might admit for end of life care. But all of those are perfectly reasonable, but we need an acknowledgement very early that this gentleman is dying. And that is quite important because otherwise you will go down the route of doing everything for him, uh, unnecessarily prolonging his suffering and not, not achieving anything at the end of the day. And that is quite important. And doesn't matter if he's got a reversible condition or, or not, because remember, we do not treat conditions in labs. We treat them in human bodies. The bottom line is his physiologic state is so poor, his baseline is so poor, that the reversibility of the condition is unimportant. His mortality here is being predicted by his frailty state, which by the way, with a frailty score of eight, is about 25% in the first 10 days following admission to hospital, just because of having a frailty score of eight. So it's really telling you he's got an incredibly high risk of dying and we need to explore the goals of care as early as possible. So what is it you are going to do? So first of all, when you see the lower person, get a frailty score, get a 480, understand their cognitive state. You can't take a dependable history without knowing if a person was capable of giving you one, but they're cognitively intact. Do the early warning score, review it. Early warning score absolutely um, uh, predicts death in older people uh, as much as it does in younger people. So it's an important thing to know. Uh, take a drug history because drugs can play a massive role in making them unwell. And then once you've done your assessment, the question to ask, can you cure this person? So this human being with their state of frailty and their current presentation, is it curable? If it is not curable and they might be dying, can we care for them? Just because we can't put a catheter in and can't give antibiotics to somebody doesn't mean we can't care for them. So can we do that? Always communicate because the cornerstone of this management is having a shared decision with the patient. Most people with dementia are perfectly capable of making simple decisions with you, um, uh, which don't need a prolonged conversation and lots of information. You will find that the vast majority, even with moderate dementia, will be absolutely capable of having that conversation. So you must not exclude the patient from these discussions. And of course, the family, the carer, other healthcare professionals, including the GP, and you're managing uncertainty, seek senior help. Other people to help you, we have the Frailty Emergency Squad, which is a multidisciplinary team in the ED. They will come and help you. We've got palliative care nurses who can come and help you. We have got a FOPAL team, the Frail Older Persons Assessment Liaison Service, psychogeriatric team who can come and help you. And of course, if there's any quality improvement projects on frailty in the department, get involved because it'll help you learn a lot more of this fascinating condition. I'll stop here. This is just a beginning. And hopefully over the next few months, as you work with us, you will improve your learning and understanding into this incredibly fascinating group of patients and even more fascinating construct of frailty. Goodbye.